two, one. Hi, everybody. It's Dylan and Dawn. We're here for Romance Happy Hour. Um, hope you're all having a great day. We've got Lorianne Bailey and Carrie DeCevito. I hope I said that right. I have been practicing. I don't know. I don't want to say it wrong. Um, we've got them here tonight, and um, we're going to chat and get a, a little bit of a sneak peek at some of their, their books. So, Dawn. Yes. How are you? You have relocated since we last I chatted have, live. Yeah, I'm in uh, Virginia now, and I'm trying and just hanging out. I have a house. See, this is my room and not my RV. It's a real wall behind you. I know. I almost didn't recognize you. It's a real wall behind you. <laughs> yeah. How long did you guys live in that RV? A year and a half. Um, in that RV, um, previously about six months for um, a different transfer. Um, that is a really long time with four kids and a giant dog. Yes, and we're very excited to be in a house. My kids, my boys are, well, at first they were scared of monsters, um, but now, <laughs> yeah, now they got a TV in their room and they're just, Ooh. yeah. So they're pretty happy now. Very happy. So are you all moved in? Are you back to writing? I or am. Are you still I, catching up? Yeah, I am. I'm well, I'm still catching up to you, but um I'm still waiting for the response from Harlequin and um just as even getting impatient for it. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um I am currently working on a my Coast Guard uh, lighthouse series, so contemporary for to try to submit to HQN. So that's what I'm working on now. What about you? And that sounds really cool. I can't wait until you start letting me read pieces yeah. of it. <laughs> um, yeah. I am working on the second book in the indie series that I'm gonna start self-publishing. I, I think it's gonna be in April and yeah. um, it's small town, Ooh. rural Missouri. So, mm -hmm. so I'm excited about that. It was inspired by the house that I used to go stay at when my grandparents lived there. They lived in kind of, middle of nowhere in Missouri yeah. and so yeah. so yeah so I've been furiously typing and trying to make some headway on that so have you um, been to Missouri do you, are you from the, have you been there a lot Dawn I just said that my grandparents had a house there and I spent the summers yeah. there oh okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm just giving you crap you um, here yeah. says wine a little right this is why I work wine a little <laughs> you'll feel better that's what I've been doing tonight. It's so, all right. Because I promised I would be drinking. So It's fine. No, I, I actually was born in Missouri and grew up in Texas. And then oh. I lived in Missouri again um, after I got out of college. And I had a business there for a while okay. before before love brought me north to the yeah. frigid to the minus four degrees outside right now tonight north. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop talking about myself and I'm going to bring Lori and Carrie in here okay. so we can say hello. <laughs> hello. 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 You guys are on screen now. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I know it's late for everybody except me. It's only eight o'clock for me, but it's after nine for everybody else. So thank you for staying up past your bedtimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thank even having know. wine past my bedtime because Ooh, this is happy you. hour. Because <laughs> <laughs> Lori, you're in Virginia. Yes. We were talking about before we started. And Carrie is in Ottawa. So That's right. yeah. Everybody is kind of on the north side of things. And now Dawn is in Virginia too. So oh, wow. you guys are you aren't close We're gonna to have each to get other, together. Yes, for sure. What so how far away are you? I, is Virginia Beach a few hours away? Um, I, I think my brother's working up by you. Uh I'm gonna say winds. I don't know. It starts are you more DC area, Lori? Yeah, yeah I'm right outside DC. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're about two and a half hours. Yeah, I think That's so too. Bad. We can do that. Yeah, my brother's <laughs> working up there. He uh so I might come up see and see him one of these days soon. So if I do, we'll have to have coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. Or or wine. 
<laughs> or mine. Yeah. Yes. If I can get him to drive me home. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are really excited that you guys can make it tonight um, on this very cold, <laughs> cold <laughs> night. I know, Carrie, you were saying that you just got dumped on with snow. Oh, yeah. We went from basically having a foot of snow over the last like month and a half to we're nearly at about five feet. Oh, my gosh. In accumulation. Yeah. Yeah. So within 24 hours, we got buried alive, basically. And then they decided to, you know, throw a little ice for some extra fun on the <laughs> top of it all. So <laughs> we haven't had much snow at all. I, I think I mean, since I've lived in Minnesota, this seems to be like the, the driest January we've had. I think that means we're probably going to get dumped on in March, but we'll see. Yeah. Winter's not over. <laughs> oh no, we have a long ways to go. I learned that the hard way, you know, when uh -huh. there was still like piles of snow in our driveway in April when the first year that we moved here. So, oh my gosh. Yep. Well, we're glad that you guys could make it. I think we decided that Lori is going to read first, right? Yep. I think so. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I printed out two things and I haven't decided which one I want to read. I have um, I have an excerpt from my last book that um, that I really like, but I also have one from from the uh, self pub book that I have the self pub novella that I have coming out next week. Ooh. But I I think I will go with um, my clip from my uh, scene from Highland Temptation. Ooh which is book number three in my Highland Pride series. And I told okay. her to you to the lady at my RV park, right? She was like, I only read Scottish <laughs> books. And I'm oh. like, you have to read Lori. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you have won some, um, some nice awards for your books. Yes. Yeah, for um, my first book, the um, Highland Deception. I'm having a hard time seeing what you guys can see and what you can't. Yeah, <laughs> this one won the National Reader's Choice Award and the Holt Medallion for Best First Book and Best Historical. Nice. Congratulations. So I'll have to yeah, yeah. Uh, turn the computer around a little bit and show you the, I, I got these uh, like statue things. They're really <laughs> cute. <laughs> the, actually, they, in a way, they kind of look like tombstones, but they're still really Ooh. cool. <laughs> Are they heavy? <laughs> They're kind of heavy. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations. But, um, well uh, deserved. Thank you. thank you. Well, this uh, this scene is um, from the third the third book, and it's about um, Alan and Kirsty who uh, grew up together, and it's a um, best friends uh, sister story where. <laughs> They uh, and um, and she thought it was unrequited love, but um, but they they both have always had feelings for each other and for each other and things didn't work out. And now um, they find themselves thrown together in the middle of some conspiracy and some battles and um, trying to save her brother. So this is her sneaking into the Earl of Argyle's room, who was a big bad guy uh, back in the um, seven. Well, I mean, bad guy to some people uh, back in the uh, 17th century Scotland. So are you guys ready for me to read or? We are ready. Yes, we're going to pop out of here. So you have the whole stage to yourself. OK, I'm also going to preface this with I can imagine all these accents in my head and I can imagine how this is supposed to sound, but I have never been an actress. So, <laughs> so I will do my best, but I'm not good with accents. All right. All right. <laughs> We're sure you'll do fine. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Am I on here by myself now? You are on there by yourself. You are ready to go. All right, here I go. This is uh, a scene from Highland Temptation. The lock clicked in the door and she inhaled sharply. Kirsty fell to her knees and rolled under the desk. She focused on controlling her breath. One little sound could get her discovered. What was the penalty for breaking into the Earl of Argyle's room? Surely, she would be put in prison and she couldn't save her brothers from the 
if she was in the dungeon. She didn't hear another sound, but the fire exposed a large shadow that could only be a man. It moved toward the desk and a hand clasped onto her arm, dragging her out from under the wooden structure. What do you think you're doing? Fear almost turned to annoyance when she realized the voice was Alan's. He didn't give her time to answer as he yanked her across the room and to the other side of the chamber in an instant. Opening the door, he peeked out into the hall. He must have liked their chances because he dragged her from the room and shut the door. Thankful she was tall and didn't have to strain to keep up, they'd taken three large strides in the direction of Malcolm's room when the sound of boots marched down the hall. Alan's arm still attached under hers like an eagle that had captured its prey. He stopped and spun her around, backing her harshly to the wall. She inhaled sharply at the impact. He stood over her with his arms on the walls beside her head in a fierce protective stance. Trembling, her hands locked onto Alan's side. His warmth was reassuring, but the tempo of his steady heartbeat thrummed into her fingertips. The rhythm of her own faltered at his close proximity. Hell, they're going to see you. His gaze darted from the sound and back to her. As the clacking cadence of the approaching threat neared, she spared a glance down the hall to see how close the man was. But Alan's position blocked her view. When she glanced back, something had shifted in his eyes and her inhalation of air lodged in her throat, the bodice of her gown becoming tight and restrictive as her chest swelled. In the scant light of the hall, she imagined they had darkened and dilated. Was it fear or hunger she saw there? Maybe both. Shuddering, her lips parted to let in the air that refused to reach her lungs. She froze as his hands came down to clasp both of her cheeks, again seeming to hide her face from the newcomer. One thumb traced her lips as his breathing became heavy. She, on the other hand, couldn't breathe as his head dipped closer. Damn, he was going to kiss her. Her body heated and her chin tilted up. Lips parted to give him access. No, he was going to destroy her. But right now, she didn't care. Exhilaration rushed through her as she realized she was going to let him do what he wanted. Awareness and desire claimed her as his head dipped and it became too late to protest as his lips covered hers. And that's my scene from Highland Temptation. <laughs> That was great. Thank you. Uh oh, I seem to have lost Dawn. Uh, <laughs> um, no, that was fantastic. So, thank you. I probably tell... should have prefaced that with they were in a very dangerous situation going into that scene, and he was trying to protect her. Okay. I was going to say, you're not going to tell us what happens next, then, huh? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was book three, and that one has that one's already out. So yes, that one is out. Um, so one, two, and three are out. Book number four comes out in April. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's my daughter calling from college, but I'll let my husband pick oh, no. it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here she's back. Dawn is back. <laughs> Yay. Um, so what inspired you to write in that genre? I mean, have you always had a, a pull towards I have a time always, period or? I, well, I've always had a pull toward historical romance, but I've also always had a pull toward paranormal. Ooh. So um, the, the, the first book that I wrote is a Victorian piece, but it, I, I never finished it. And uh, one day I will go back and finish it. But the this my second and third books that I've written are paranormal. 
and um, one day I will fix those and hopefully get them out for the world to see. But I feel like there's a natural progression between paranormal and Scotland because Scotland is this majestic, magical place yeah. that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to describe it unless you've just been there and you've experienced it. My husband and I uh, moved to London for a little while and we went to we we took the train up to edinburgh and just something about that place it, it called to me it stuck with me between that and already having the interest in historical romance something just happened and it clicked and that's what i love and the uh, the scene that i didn't read from my novella that's coming out takes place in um in edinburgh and I've also written into, um, oh, it was in Highland Temptation, the book that I just read the scene from. I Part of that talks about um, the Abbey ruins at Hollywood Palace, which is right at the end, um, down the hill from Edinburgh Castle. It's where the queen stays when she goes to Edinburgh. Okay. But there's ruins of this abbey and they were just so magical to me and I can still remember, I included them in that book. So. Okay, so I'm now really super jealous of you. Like I, yeah. was, I wasn't <laughs> enough before because you're such an amazing author. Now I'm like super jealous. I, I want to live, I want to go to England so bad and you know, oh yeah. Imagine. I, you know, we we were supposed to be there for 18 months, I believe, but my husband's project got cut short. Oh. So we were only there three and a half months. And I had a six month old baby at the time. Oh I was traveling around London. I mean, I walked just about anywhere I ever would have gone, wanted to go see in yeah. London, but we didn't get to do everything else we wanted to because our time got short. We made it to Edinburgh. We made it up to Stonehenge and some of the other historic sites there in England. And we made it to Paris, but that was all we had time to do before we moved back. Aww. My husband had two opportunities to get stationed in England. Mm -hmm. I fought with him tooth and nail and he refused. <laughs> yeah. He didn't go as Alaska. That's oh, it. he chose Alaska over England? Yeah, I know. Oh. It was, to be fair, it was one of the best, you know, it's units that we've been to. Um, yeah. Because it's just so beautiful. But and I keep even now, every time he gets a new unit, I'm like, England, England, England. And he's like, no. <laughs> well, now if you go to England, I can come visit you. But now you're close enough. We've got to, we've got to spend more time together. Yeah, we do, for sure. <laughs> So maybe we can somehow figure out how to have romance happy hour in England sometime. I Dawn. know after Hawaii, because last time we were going to Hawaii. <laughs> we'll have to do a around the world with romance yes. happy hour. How's that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> after we each make our our first million writing um writing romance novels, we'll do a around the world. Do it. We'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully, you hopefully, it won't that long. But yeah, we'll see. Can you get an apartment in like a in like a yacht that goes around the world, right? We should do that. I don't know. You start looking into it now. Yeah. Yeah. You guys can all come visit us. It'll be fun. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll come visit. I don't think I could spend that much time on a yacht constrained in one place, though. <laughs> I mean, my husband got sick. He'd probably kill me if I told you this. But yeah, we went to Alaska and went out to see the glaciers and yeah. he ended up getting seasick on the little boat that that you take out to see the glaciers so well to be fair little boats are more rough and he was in the Bering Sea so we'll be yeah there. I suppose <laughs> yeah you know what it, it happened to my husband too on our honeymoon we were Ooh. on a we were on a cruise in um uh, the Aegean, uh, I think it was in the Aegean Sea. We were somewhere over that way. And um, we we hit some really rough waters. And I have a completely different constitution. He's laying on the bed groaning. He's feeling so bad. And I'm standing up in the room with my arms like this yeah. going, wee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was my not God. happy with me. No, I would imagine not. <laughs> my husband I, I had issues when we went um when i was a kid we went to hawaii um 
and we went deep sea fishing and I got sick on that boat. Mm-hmm. They said, no matter what you do, don't get sick in the bathroom on the boat. And of course I went down to use the bathroom and then you're in that little tiny space uh, and you're moving like this. And then I got sick. And so then I was, yeah. I think I was 12 or so at the time. So I was afraid I was going to be the one that kept getting seasick. But yeah, my husband was on a 110, 110 foot cutter out of, out of Washington. So the seas out there are similar to the Bering Sea, if not a little bit more dangerous because of the placement. But um, he said the, the 110 foot cutter is designed to take 180 degree roll. Mm-hmm. So he says he would go, uh, go puke over the side and then he'd start <laughs> doing his rounds. And he said you would, you would literally be like your face was like this close to the floor because you're at an almost 40, you know, 180 degree wall. <laughs> and you'd see a wall of water just coming and then the boat would tip. And he said, but uh, so he, you know, he's he's going to be deployed soon again. And he's like, get me Dramamine just in case. <laughs> like, yeah. Just in case. He doesn't want to be like. like see, I'd be okay with that if Aquaman came to save us. Right. Oh yeah. But we we digress. <laughs> yeah. We should probably let um <laughs> Carrie have a turn now. Her <laughs> hubby's from Alaska. Oh, Alaska. I just saw that. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Catherine said that. Yeah. <laughs> Where in Alaska, I wonder, is he from? And then Linda said she what went deep sea fishing, was the only woman yeah. that was not sick. Right. So you had a ball. <laughs> I don't know. I can imagine you doing that, Linda. We have not met Linda in person, but I can imagine Linda being yeah. the only one that doesn't get sick and has a ball fishing. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, my mom says move home to Alaska or move home to Montana. That's what she's been telling me for a while now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know, John. At the rate you get around, girlfriend, you'll be back in Montana in no time. I hope. I don't know. Virginia's nice. She needs to stay here for a while. I don't know. Oh, Anchorage. I love Anchorage. I do love Anchorage. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I jump overboard for Aquaman. Yeah. <laughs> maybe some of the others of us might do that too. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know, Carrie, are you ready to follow that conversation? (laughs) Do you have a a sexy merman in your book? (laughs) No, unfortunately I don't. (laughs) Oh, darn. I do, however, have a sexy police detective. So that works too. We can all, uh, we we can all switch over to that uh, that way of thinking, I suppose. (laughs) That sounds good. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you write. Uh, I write, actually, I dabble in a few different things. So I have a full five book series out uh, in contemporary romance called The Broken Men Chronicles. And uh, I also have a three book uh, trilogy, basically, um, in paranormal romance, the Essence Extracted series. And I also have, I'm currently writing actually the third book uh, in um, my Nightshade series, which is basically a uh, romantic suspense with an erotic flair. So yeah. so you figured out how to balance the uh, paranormal <laughs> and mixed genres. Uh, so. it's, it's, it's a tricky, yeah, I find it the tricky kind of balance really, because I mean, you have to be in the right mindset depending on what, you know, project you currently have going on. So it's not, uh, it's not always, uh, um, uh, let's just say it's not always that easy for me, uh, in order to sort of, you know, mix the genres up continuously. So I kind of go with, uh, with the flow and how I'm feeling at that time. And then I, you know, I just keep plugging away at all the various projects I have on the go and, yeah. Then set a, a plan with regards to releases and everything. So, <laughs> yeah. So what are you reading from tonight? I am reading, um, actually, I'll give you uh, three different views uh, or points of views uh, from uh, Night Shift, which is book two of uh, the Nightshade series. So you'll you'll get a, a, a glimpse in... Uh, part of my dark mind in there as, <laughs> as well as the male and female uh, 
uh, lead character point of views. So, all right. Yeah. Well, do you want to set up the scene? I'm gonna put you on here so it's just you, and then do you need to set the scene for us at all, or? Uh, no, not really. I'm pretty much starting right from the get go of the book. Okay. So, yeah. All right. The screen is yours. <clears throat> what are you doing here? The tension around me palpable. She hurried aside to let me enter before closing the door behind us. My blood boiled. My skin crawled that she'd let him do that to her. I had to get rid of it, the taint, purify her. What have you done? You're mine, Evie. I told you when I came back, you'd be mine, and now look at yourself. Disgust was as clear in my voice as it was in my expression. What, whatever it is, we can talk about it. Talk this out, she stuttered, her feet inching her backward as I followed her movements. Reaching to the small of my back, my fingers wrapped around the grip as I pulled it from its sheath. The eighth inch blade caught the glint of the afternoon sun, mesmerizing me, causing me to admire the play of light against it before I focused on the woman before me. Her eyes shone with terror. You don't. She shook her head left to right, swallowing hard, stumbling against the side table next to the sofa. You don't have to do this, she righted herself. She can still, be, we can still be together now that, now that you're back. I shot her an incredulous look. Did she think me a fool? You've gone and done the unthinkable. You had his child. I hollered, my knuckles gripping the knife tightly. This is the only way, the only way to get rid of the stain. Her steps froze momentarily. Stain? It's what I should have done a while ago, I spat cornering her as her steps were halted by the wall at her back. What you took from me, what should have been mine, I raged, is what I'll take from you. One moment, my eyes darted toward the hallway where I knew the devil lay in slumber, and the next, Ava Peters was making a mad rush toward the door that separated me from saving us all. No, she panted, you're crazy. If she only knew, move, Evie. I growled. It's the only way. She's not here. Please. Tears streamed down her face, her body shaking with fear. Using the tip of the blade, I ran it over her soaked cheek, the metal sharp enough to catch on her ivory skin, causing a streak of blood to suddenly materialize. I felt lighter instantly, powerful, in control, a feeling I hadn't in quite some time. Manning my knife, I proceeded to run the tip of it down to the bottom of her lip, nicking it just enough for another bubble of her essence to form. Mm. I groaned, leaning forward to press my front against hers, taking the time to lick her damaged lip, then whispered my new realization while rubbing my impossibly hard cock against her stomach. I was wrong. This, I ran my finger through the blood on her cheek, watching its movement, is what I need, Evie. The sadness was overwhelming as I stared at the beauty laying limp and lifeless beneath me. The rage I'd felt had all but dissipated with each slice of my blade through her flesh, like a hot knife through butter each time blood began to pour out, a weight lifted within me. What once held pleading in her eyes was now long gone. She was nothing but a piece of art, trussed up by her silk scarves, a vessel conveying my message. I'd be back. And then I will switch to something else here. <clears throat> so this takes place eight years later. The moment I walked over the threshold, I knew cl a clusterfuck of epic proportions awaited me. Blood was everywhere, spattered by the front door, smears over the walls, and droplets leading to where I knew the victim would ultimately be laying in a pool of her life's essence. Forensics was going to have a field day with this one, just like with all the other 15. Donning the protective gear and the lead officer had... Uh, that the lead officer had ordered me to change into before entering the scene, I made my way toward the back of the house. Carefully avoiding one evidence marker after another, I entered the master bedroom, the grisly sight of Victoria Sparks' mutilated body lying face up on the bed greeted me. The standard ligatures on her wrists and ankles proved that she'd been restrained and alive through most of her torture, the killer le leaving her to die in excruciating pain from her wounds and ultimately blood loss. 
The scent of copper in the air thickened as I made my final approach, slipping my hands into a pair of rubber gloves. I was looking for something I knew was meant for me. Setting my evidence kit down beside the bed, I bent toward the body in search of my next clue. The sickening crack of the victim's jaw set my stomach to roiling as I pulled my mouth open, her mouth open, locating the three pieces I had come to expect after so many years of chasing this perp. Letting go of the victim, I grasped my digital camera and photographed my findings. Setting the camera down, I whipped out the small evidence bag from my kit and opened it, manning my tweezers. Fishing the objects out one by one, I dropped them into the bag, then photographed them again. Fragments of a photograph were what this sicko left. Camera in hand, I shot a few frames of the room as well as the rest of the premises. The team would have their own photos, but I liked being thorough with my investigations, thus preferred gathering my own shots, comparing them to the others. Closing up my kit, I stood to, make, to take my leave. Fucking sadistic bastard and his games. It pissed me off that he was always one step ahead ahead of me. Thinking on those tiny pieces, the unknown subject of, or unsub's calling card, I was confused more than ever as to why he was leaving them at every scene. The letter I had received at the precinct a week after the first murder had alluded that they were all part of some demented countdown, a puzzle of sorts. One thing was clear, however, the perp was after me, and after 16 murders, I still wasn't any closer to finding this guy. In my career as a detective, I'd come across a lot of questionable characters. I'd done my fair share of arresting the dredges of society and making enemies along the way. You couldn't be a cop without that happening. I take it that Rosie is in for another disappointing birthday dinner? Will asked, coming to a stop at my side as I exited the victim's home. Two days a year, I dealt with this bullshit. One being my daughter's birthday, the other was a day I'd rather forget. For the last eight years, it had been the same fucking story. That in itself was enough to confirm that the unsub was gunning for me. That, and the fact that he'd started this spree of his, claiming none other than my wife as his first victim. And then finally, I have one last bit. And this is from our female's perspective. Her name's Amberlynn. Um, my apologies, the second excerpt was actually from Shane Peters, who plays our police detective. Um, so on with Emberlyn's part. I was tinkering in the garden when I heard the car roll up the drive, but I paid it no attention. I'd been neighbors with the Peters going on two years now, ever since my grandmother left me, her house in her will. It had been the best and smartest decision for me. I'd needed a change of pace, a change of location, and living where I'd f I felt safest all my life couldn't be ignored. Amber, I heard Lena Rose call out. I have cake. Leaving my bowl of cut blooms on the ground, I wiped my hands onto my already soiled jeans and stood looking her way. The kinks in my back stretched and popped from their stiffness of being crouched on the ground for so long. Lucky girl, I called out. Did you want some? Fuck, the child had found my weakness, but I wasn't going to let her in on it. No, I smiled, but thank you, sweets. Okay, bye. Running inside, I realized that Shane was still staring at me, a quirking of his lips, the only indicator that he was humored by our exchange. The rest of him was rock solid, dominating and assessing. With a quick wave of my hand as both hello and goodbye, I bent to pick up my tools and the bowl I used to collect the blooms I needed for the new batches of essential oils I was fixing to get started on. When I looked back from my front door, the man was gone. I just finished setting the oils to the side of the uh, for cooling when my doorbell rang. No one came calling these days except for the mailman and assorted courier services. And your ex, apparently. Since my front door was one of those solid wood numbers with an arched top without windows, I used the small window at its side to see who my visitor was. Shane Peters. Well, Shane's back to be more precise. Shit. Instantly, my mind started whirling. Had I done something wrong? I had been spending more time with his daughter lately. Maybe he just thought it was weird and wanted to warn me off. I mean, it is weird, right? Maybe he wanted to buy some lotion, studying the man for a little longer. I wasn't quick enough to quell the bubbling laughter that trickled out of me. He didn't look like the type of man to use lotion. Then again, what would I know? Finally, getting a hold of my bed of hilarity, I reached for the doorknob and opened the door. 
The man turned and whatever remained of my humor fled as I took the whole of him in. I'd never seen him up close like this. His dark blonde hair was a little messy, probably from running his hands through it. He wore his badge, which told me he was most likely heading back to work. He worked a lot from what Nora, Shane's mother, and Lana Rose had told me. Then again, so did I. Aside from the black dress shirt and the faded denim he sported, his feet were encased in black boots. How he got that shirt to fit over his beefy shoulders and arms was beyond me. But the entire look had my mouth watering, and so did the slice of cake he was holding. Hey, his voice was smooth. What's so funny? Nothing, I stuttered, feeling like an idiot. Did I catch you at a bad time, he asked, his eyes studying me. All I could do was shake my head no. Here, handing me the paper plate with a slice of cake, I took it and stared at the tasty-looking morsel. Your mouth said no, but your eyes told the truth. You weren't imposing, by the way. I, thank you, that's really kind of you. I turned to set the plate on the table next to the door, still standing on the threshold. He shrugged his shoulders. No problem. My, would you like to come in, came at the same time as his, I should go. We both ended up smiling at one another, and I could feel heat rising in my face. Be safe, I bade him. At work, I mean. You are heading to work, right? I really should learn how to talk to hot men. Then again, being 33, I doubt you could teach me that trick. If I ever entertain the thought of settling down again, that person would have to take me as I was. His smile was tight, his eyes darkening. Yeah. Turning, he walked down from my front steps and turned when he reached the walkway. Have a good night, Emberlyn. Not waiting on my reply, he waved across the street, then jumped in his car and left. Thanks for the cake, I whispered as I watched him drive off. Closing the door and locking it, I grabbed the, the small plate and headed for the kitchen. I jumped up to sit on my island countertop, reached over to grab a fork out of the drawer, then set to remove the plastic wrap before digging in. The decadence of the chocolate cake had me moaning and forgetting about my troubles, sitting on the same surface I was on, only a mere few feet away. Instead, I daydreamed about a certain blonde detective stud who lived across the street, wondering what my current indulgence would taste like if he were or if he were smeared in it. And that's it. Nice. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Let me ask you. Do you watch a lot of crime shows? I do and I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I used to lately. Uh, no, not really. Uh, I have uh, actually sat down to try and give a whirl or give uh, give a shot to uh, how to get away with murder. But uh, I typically try not to uh, let what I watch influence what I write. <laughs> so do you work in crime uh, in, in the like um, detective criminal agents? In criminology or anything like that? No, not really. My background is actually medical. I studied to be a respiratory therapist. Oh, okay. And uh, I ended up working a couple of years for the Canada Council for the Arts in the writing and publishing uh, section. And then from there on out, now I actually have a full-time gig with uh, the government. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did you decide to, to write um, this? like write detective a detective book uh well suspense in itself was always uh one of my favorite go-to type genres when uh while growing up and then even as an adult and that and uh how i actually stumbled upon um i guess um erotic novels or, or an erotic style or flair to my writing was basically just a test and i mean still to this day i mean my first erotic type book was released in 2015. And to this day, I mean, we're looking at four plus years down the line and I'm still blushing while I'm writing these scenes, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but it, it, what started as um, basically a test uh, pretty much turned into, um, I guess, one of my niches. Yeah. So <laughs> I hope the readers agree. <laughs> Oh, and also, Linda wants to know where you get your inspiration from. Uh, everywhere, really. I mean, whether it be, you know, the male point of view type series that I had with uh, the Broken Man uh, Men Chronicles. 
I mean, um, let's just say I used to hang out with a lot more men than women. I used to actually get along better with men, <laughs> especially in my 20s um, and, and whatnot. But uh, as we grew older and into our 30s and, and, and beyond that, um, you know, you kind of come to realize that we're not all different really with, you know, the, the final outcome or what we want out of life and, and whatnot. So some of it's based off of, you know, relationships and people I've known or, you know, um, stories I've heard of, read, in, read of, or read about. Um, some of it's from, you know, just a random scene on TV for just sparks this kind of idea. Yeah. And, you know, I may just run with it. So um, I have to say, basically anything and everything can serve as as inspiration, really, when it comes down to writing. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, as an author, I'm not the only one who feels that way. So. <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, I got I got a um, inspiration from I love to get. In, with my historicals, um, inspiration from true, like odd historical facts, like the first yeah. book I ever write, wrote, um, I started writing it because I learned that um, the military in, 19, in 1850 brought camels to Montana to help with the Indian problem. They oh my God. Problem. And so the camels were just so stubborn that they wouldn't work and they released them into the wild so for a while there were wild camels in montana oh and cool. that, that sparked my very first like well that's yeah that's, book. that's exactly it i mean i you know uh, mm -hmm. I, I i know quite a few other authors out there as well as myself i mean i i enjoy doing some research and actually finding out you know when 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 you actually have something that's based on fact it's kind of neat to be able to incorporate it into yeah. into your book or you know whatever work you're you're working yeah. on or it may inspire a new book or a new story right so uh, with that Deanna wants to know what your favorite scene was to write my favorite scene oh <laughs> um my gosh I think the first time they actually did the nasty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of enough, people said, avoid those scenes, so that's <laughs> funny that that was your favorite scene to write. <laughs> it, it's one of those things. I, I don't know. Maybe I just I, I, I strive a little bit harder when I write those scenes, and um, I mean it, it can get difficult to to sort of you know play those things out. Um, but uh, with them, it was just, you know, it was one of those type of things where she's like, you know what, yeah, never on the first date kind of thing. And their date kind of started off on the rocky side and, uh, you know, they ended up in the emergency room <laughs> and whatnot. And where you kind of thought, you know, everything would sort of snowball and sort of not happen sort of led to just, you know, you know, let's just go with the flow and the, the go with the flow, the down to earthness of, of both of both characters together, you know, sort of, um, I guess, sort of, it's a great portrayal of, of basically everyday life, right? We all roll with the punches when something goes or it goes wrong or goes awry. So, um, I mean, that was, you know, there was a little bit of comic relief in there, along with some heat and some, you know, some serious points. So it was, it was a good balance of everything. So that was probably uh, one of my favorite scenes to to write in that book. Yeah, I just like to shout out to my mom, who's um, also giving out who how I get my inspiration. <laughs> my sister, so, uh, I love it when your mom tunes in, Don. It's so much fun. Oh, that's great. <laughs> my, sister, my Montana Girl series is actually based on my sister. So my sister Dusty, the book with the camel. Um, so I'm gonna, and, and if Dusty ever watches this, she's gonna kill me for telling this. But <laughs> she she was an inspiration in herself because she is extremely clumsy, and. <laughs> she's the sweetest girl and she's just so um brave and you know a go-getter but she's extremely clumsy um she's so clumsy in fact that she got shot nine times by just standing there oh my <laughs> <laughs> clumsy or one hell of a lucky woman is what i would yeah. call it. Nine, 
to be fair. Flames, or no, look, at it's not. look at it shot. Look to survive. It was a buck shot. So, so um, oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that feels any better. Um, but she was. I mean, she wasn't injured anything more than she had covered her, all of her vital parts. And, wow. <laughs> and wow. then my sister Aileen, she's just so spunky. She's she's the one that I'm I'm having a hard time writing hers right now, just because I keep moving every time I'm supposed to be. <laughs> right. but, but yes, uh, Catherine, all of the names, my sister's names, do start with the D. I had to. Um, to shake it up in the book a little bit because my first editor ever told me that it was way too confusing to have five girls named D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but all of my sisters and my brother, where there's six of us total, we're all uh, actually we all have DJ, and and you know when we were Terrell, my last name it was DJT. All all. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It must be confusing at your house. Yeah, it, it must have been. You know, I heard my mom, Don, Danelle, Dia, Eileen, Dusty. I mean, Dallin. Get yeah, down I, there. I, I have four kids, and all of their names start with a different letter and end with a different letter, so they yeah. sound completely different. And I still get them all mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a miracle, honestly, in my household that we don't end up naming the kids after the dog's name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've done that before. I've called the kids the dog's name. It doesn't go over very well. Yeah, yeah. I've done it before, too. <laughs> name Bronk. <laughs> Thank you. I won't have to call you the dog's name. So, no so funny. Hey, you. Just hey, everybody answer by hey, you, and then eventually I'll have the right person. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was going to ask a little bit about um, for both of you your process. Yes. Are you plotters? Are you pantsers? <laughs> How do you you know take or, the idea all the way from start to finish? Or are you a planter like Dylan introduced me to with the little yeah. ribbon at RWA with the plant? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I um. I am a bit of a plotter. I used to be more of a pantser, but as I've written more, I've developed a little bit more of a strategy. And for me, at this point, I have to know my dark moment before I can even start the story. But then things change as I go along because I really don't know my characters until about two or three chapters in and know them as well as I think I should, even though I have an idea of where I want everything to go. And I have a lot of scenes already not essentially plotted out, but written down in a synopsis just just as a guideline. But then my characters do grow and change as I write. So I'm open to pantsing along with my plotting. Now, is that your plot board behind you? This, yes, this is actually one that I, I don't have too much information on it. I thought about <laughs> hiding it, <laughs> but as you can see too, I'm my, the book oh, that I'm working on right now, I kept pointing, there's a cat in this book. So my, <laughs> I, I drew a picture of the cat because my son and I were talking about um, <laughs> because he's interested in writing. We were talking about how I'm going to have a character that has conversations with the cat so that you can understand things <laughs> that, that the character's thinking. But he wrote hi cat up there. And then my other son came in and decided he wanted to draw a camel. I don't know if you can see this <laughs> thing over here. It started out as a camel, but now it has crazy horns and weird teeth. And every time they come in here, they add something to it. So, um, yes, this is my initial board that I do just to give myself a guideline of uh, timing and when I want things to happen. And yeah, you know, I add to it a lot. I subtract from it. I mean, obviously, I'm not very far into this book yet. This is uh, this is the second book in a new series that I'm writing, mm -hmm. and um, I just finished the first one and. Jess has it, our um, Dylan and uh, Dawn's agent um, has it. So I'm hoping that uh, hoping that we get that out there and somebody's gonna love it because I think it's awesome. 
It's uh, so the, the new series that I'm writing is about a band of brothers and sisters who have come together on the streets of Aberdeen, Scotland. It's in Regents, it's Regency Highlanders, and they've all lost their families and they're criminals living on the streets, and they've come together to um, come together to form a family unit. And they're all criminals, but uh, they all get their happy ever mm -hmm. after, and they all oh, wow. are redeemable. So I just have to say my first heroine is a pickpocket. And oh. I think she, I think she's awesome. <laughs> so so like a modern day Oliver set in Scotland. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> kind of cool. Oh, that sounds like fun. And yeah. this, this one is a lot of fun to write. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to write heroes that aren't perfect and that have some major major flaws i mean obviously uh, she's a criminal and the the hero the hero in my second book is going to be a cat burglar and the heroine in my third one is going to be a con artist okay. so, now, do, you do, do you do a character development at the beginning or do you just wing it with your developments I have already done character development for all of these just because I had a plan of where I wanted to go with it to begin with. And yeah. I went to a, um, a Lisa Cron workshop. I don't know if you guys all know Lisa Cron, but she's really, I, I love her method of the um, characters having misbeliefs and what they think is, what they think is wrong with themselves even though it's not really wrong it, yeah. there's this whole thing to it and i love it but uh, i sat there and i plotted out two of these books during her workshop because i already had an wow. idea of what, it, what i wanted to do but it helped me with the characterization as we were going along so. i do the math algorithm for my characterization have you seen that no. I don't know the math math algorithm. Yeah. Oh, but math would not be good for me. So. I math, but this is like it works in conjunction with the hero and heroine archetype book. Mm -hmm. And oh, I love it. Like, yeah. I, what, what I, is this? You've been holding out on me for how long? What is this math thing you're talking about? I'll have to email it to you. I did it on myself, and, I, and I'm telling you right now, it is 100% accurate. It's like but, numerology. Yeah. Are, are you getting yeah. into the woo woo with us? <laughs> I've had like three glasses of wine. Oh boy. I don't know what that means right now. <laughs> well, you'll have to share your, your math method. Where'd you pick I this up? I, you know, okay. So I, with Whitewater Passion, I had, before it got published anything, I had submitted it to the Catherine contest. And that's up in your kind of area, Canada area, Toronto's uh, Romance Writers Association. And I won it. Um, but one of the contest judges loved it so much that she came back to me. And then we've been talking since. So she sends me like things. And she sent me this like algorithm that I can do like to, to do my character development. And it freaking <laughs> worked takes your vowels oh. and your consonances and you mesh it together and then it helps you also to define a um <laughs> my mom just said i didn't do math in school which is <laughs> 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 um, yeah it, it also helps you come up with a conflict like with an internal conflict that you can use um to to drive your character your your plot forward so yeah okay. that, really okay. yeah. that sounds really interesting i'll have to get more info on that yeah i'll share it i'll share it and it's really fun to do your own name and your husband's okay. name to see hmm. how cool this is right <laughs> with me but and my husband anyways what if i find out after 18 and a half years of marriage that we weren't supposed to be together <laughs> <laughs> but you can wow. always find a reason why you're supposed to be together, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, my husband and I are both Tauruses. Do you think that we mesh well? <laughs> my husband and I are both Leos. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you going to tell us what you are, Carrie? Uh, I'm a Scorpio with a Cancer. Oh. <laughs> 
I don't know if that's good or not. I haven't paid that much well, attention. Yeah, apparently, I'm it's the best first too, match though. For... I'm sorry, what? No, apparently, it's the the best love match for me. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, my husband is a Capricorn. So he's a goat, and I'm a bull. I was just I'm more towards you. Oh, I love you, girl. I knew I loved you. I swear we together. Oh, Linda says I'm screwed. Why am I screwed, Linda? All right, I want to hear Carrie's process. Do you have a similar process? Do you do math to plot your books, or do you write words? I'll I'll do the 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 planster. Really, okay. I mean, okay. I'll I'll start off with a you know an idea of the beginning, middle, and end kind of thing. Um, you know, if there's major key points, I want to make sure I'm not going to want to forget about them in order to include them. Then I'll write them down, and everything's kind of point form kind of thing. And as you know, everything gets written in, um, I'll cross it off my list just to sort of deter my eye from going over ideas that were already basically tackled and included. So. Um, it also eliminates any rep <laughs> repetition uh, in the process. But other than that, I mean, everything else, you know, my the main ideas are basically written down. Uh, but everything else is kind of fly by the seat of my pants kind of thing. And nothing's really set in, in stone. I mean, if I have to alter something, um, I'm usually more satisfied after I've actually altered something than had I um, left it on its own. So, yeah. So a little bit of both. Okay. What I think you? that's what that's what I do. I'm trying yeah. to get better at plotting though, because I, I found Lori, you were saying that you don't get to know your characters till maybe two or three chapters mm -hmm. in. And sometimes I feel like I don't really get to know mine until I'm, you know, like sixty thousand words in. And um, well, it, yeah, it, it's true. It's true. It would just be so much more efficient if I could just know them really well right off the bat. And so, yeah. you know, I've tried to get better about plotting, but I also like to be surprised because, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, there's no greater feeling than to be writing and writing and then somebody shows up that you weren't expecting or hadn't thought of and they just pop in and and start doing their thing. And so I like to surprise myself as I go to. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't want to plot everything out. I know there are some authors that will you know, write like a 40,000 word outline. And I mean, by then, you know, you just add a few. Really so why are you boring? Yeah, <laughs> What's that? that. <laughs> I said by 40,000 words, you already have a book. So why are yeah, I know that's yeah. what I was going to say. You just have to add a little bit more and then you've got the whole book. But um, expand on everything. <laughs> well, right. And so I think maybe that's what I do. Maybe I, my first draft is just a really crappy long outline. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I'm an extensive plotter. I write the whole first draft, the plot, um, yeah. and then I go back and write the book after. Yeah. That's what I'm going to tell people from now on. It's a it's a new system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I know we're kind of getting short on time. I don't know. Does anybody have any questions for Carrie or Lori? So before we wrap up. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody pops up, do you want to tell what you're giving away? Because we did post a giveaway post. Um, you're each giving away uh, a copy of one of your books. That's right. So, <laughs> Carrie, you want to go first? Sure. I am giving away a copy of uh, book two in the Nightshade series. So uh, part of what I read tonight is actually in this book. Um, so, uh, we've got Night Shift and, of course, the story is about Shane Peters, a detective in, uh, uh, part of the Jacksonville, North Carolina Police Detachment. Um, so we've got, uh, uh, your serial killer, of course. So, um, I'm sure you probably enjoyed that dark intro. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't see her. I scared the crap out of her and she'd never get on my bad side because of it. <laughs> I wondered if maybe we'd accidentally booked like a thriller crime fiction author because it was so detailed. And then I was like, oops. A <laughs> it, was really good. it was standalone or a series. Very gripping. Uh, they're actually standalones within a series. Okay. So you're not, you're not necessarily obliged to actually read the first one. I mean, it never really hurts to read them in the, in the right order. 
Um, but uh, no, you can definitely get away with simply reading this one, for example, and, and, and not feeling lost whatsoever. I mean, some of the characters from the previous book uh, come into play, but I mean, they're, they're secondary characters and they're not, um, I mean, they're not really, um, you don't need to know about them, let's just say, in order to actually get, you know, what's going on. So, yeah, so that's what it is. Um, but yeah, a signed copy of Night Shift. For one All the way from people. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Land of ice and snow. <laughs> And I am giving away a signed copy of Highland Deception. This is the book that won the National Reader's Choice in the Holt Medallion for Best Historical and Best First Book. Um, it's, uh, I'm trying to think what all it has in it because it's been a while since I wrote this one. But, um, but um, when they meet, uh, she's dressed as a man. Um, I love and <laughs> <laughs> and at first he doesn't know, but he figures it out pretty quickly. But the whole thing is, is she's running away from home. He wants to take her home, but she won't tell him who he is, who she is. There's a very good reason for it. Um, so she won't tell him who, and he's responsible for her. So he ends up having to take her home. So question, sorry. Yeah. Is that the book you sold Jess on too? That you've, no, no, I already had um, this one published before. Okay. Um, I was gonna say because Jess, you must like like uh, women dressed like women dressing up like men in historical times too, because she, <laughs> she bought my book. Uh, and my favorite heroine was dressed up like a guy. Three too. glasses of wine on his head tonight. I, know. I, yeah. <laughs> I will admit, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, everyone wants to know that you mentioned being in the Aegean Sea. If she heard you correctly, did you visit Greece in what part? Oh, uh, let's see. When we went, um, it was on our honeymoon. We went to um, we went to Crete and Heraklion and um, Santorini. So we went, oh, actually we went to Athens too. It, it, it's been 20 years. I've been married 20 years. So <laughs> I have to remember back. I, you know what? After 20 years, my husband should take me back, right? right. We should. Uh -huh. We agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we, we, did, um, we did Italy and Greece. So we broke it up and we um, split up a couple things. I mean, we didn't get to see everything we wanted to, but it was, it was a really amazing honeymoon. And at, at the time, I was really into Greek history because I had taken a Greek history in class uh, in college. And you know what? If I had only known years ago how much I loved history and how much I loved English and put those things together, I would have been writing so long ago. But I didn't figure it out until recently. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Jamie wants to know, uh, Favorite book we've had have written. What what what's your favorite book you wrote? Carrie, you want to go first? Ooh, I'll let you take take that one. <laughs> okay, all right. I do have a favorite, <laughs> and it, it always tends to be the one that I just wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and and this time it happens to be the one with my pickpocket. So since I'm going to elaborate that on a little bit more, uh, I I my series is the Highland Misfits, and I'm hoping that stays. But my uh, pickpocket in the opening scene is walking down the street, and she picks the pocket of an English earl who has just come to Aberdeen, Scotland to win his family fortune back. Oh. So he wins it back that evening. She steals it from him, and then she won't <laughs> give it back to him because she needs it for another purpose. So the there's a lot of great conflict going on in it. And I, I love the chemistry between my characters. Yeah, that's awesome. Terry? Uh, for me, actually, um, it was actually book one of the Nightshade series. Um, my, my favorite character was uh, the heroine in the book who happened to be some kind of uh, recluse kind of woman due to health issues and whatnot. So she developed um, kind of a, 
a quasi talent uh, to enter things through the back door via hacking and whatnot. So, um, you know, she kind of appeared at the end of my first contemporary series. And then it was actually her who pretty much inspired uh, the romantic suspense thriller slash or slash thriller type angle with the night with the nightshade series. So, um, uh, let's just say Devlin was definitely, um, a spunky individual, uh, as much as she was sort of a hermit and, uh, um, you know, afraid of kind of being out there in society and crowds and whatnot. She was kind of, you know, introverted and whatnot. Um, She's the, the kind of character that sort of came out of her shell and finally got out there and learned how to spoke her mind, to speak her mind and stand up for herself and whatnot. So um, I think it's something that far too many people sort of neglect and she sort of became an inspiration as well. So nice. yeah. you have a favorite book you've written, Dawn? Um, I, I have two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my my water fashion is my favorite uh, historical, and um, that's because I dump my my heroin in in an outhouse, like she gets dumped <laughs> right inside of it, and I don't know why, but that was my favorite scene ever to write. And, um, she hates me for it, but um, <laughs> my but my all time favorite is my um, boot camp uh, coast guard boot camp story. That is out with Harlequin right now. I and I just really wish that I could hear from it, whether they're going to pick it up or not. <laughs> if not, I'm going to publish it. But um, yeah, so we're, we're waiting on that one. And it was my favorite because you know the the hero is inspired by my husband, so who was mm -hmm. a film director. So and then it also lays out all the politics of boot camp. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I read that one years ago. Yeah, when you cool. had just finished it. Oh. Yeah, I finished it in yeah. 2013 or something. It'll be nice to see that one come to life. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dylan? I don't know. I was thinking about that as you guys are answering the question. I don't know. I mean, I, I think like Lori, you know, it's kind of whatever I'm most excited about working on right now. I mean, I just turned in edits on uh, Cowboy Charming, which is coming out the uh, it holiday Texas book that's coming out in July. And I mean, I just, I really loved writing that book because it's the third in the series. So I've spent time with the family and the town and, um, and they were kind of a, they were fun to write. Yeah. Presley's kind of the bad boy and Dixie is the preacher's daughter. And so um, there's just, you know, inherent conflict and tension and all kinds of possibilities there. So I, guess, so I love the names of your heroes in that the what? your heroes of the series. Or the um her her um the the Presley and oh they're all um it's the oldest honky tonk in Texas and they're all named after country stars that played there except for poor Presley who's named after Elvis Presley. Oh. So <laughs> they, they claim that Elvis played there and they have a napkin that he supposedly wiped his mouth with framed <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> so yeah. His his mama was a big Elvis fan, so so he got stuck with Presley. That's hilarious. I love it. So that's fun, but yeah, I, I really like that world and that was a fun book to write. Yeah. So, so, all right, I think we've gone over. I appreciate you sticking with us and taking part and um, I don't know, do you have anything else to say, Dawn? Did you wanna say who we have coming up next time? Yeah, so we're gonna be the next um, one we have is gonna be on Valentine's Day. So Miss uh, Stephanie Queen and Marie Booth will be here. They will be foregoing their Valentine's dates to be with you guys. So <laughs> as will we. Yes, we yeah. will. <laughs> yes, we're going to come spend time with you instead of our Valentine's. Yeah. So my husband. Although I, see, um, I saw a t-shirt at Target today that said, wine is my Valentine. And I almost bought it, Ooh. but I didn't want to offend my husband. But yeah. No. <laughs> My husband's going to be, be um, deployed, so what I got him a box of chocolates, and I was going to hide it in his clothes, and of course, he found it early, and so he's been uh -oh. 
Uh, <laughs> did he already eat it? Because no, my husband's I, like a bloodhound when it comes to chocolate. I mean, he can find it if it's locked in a cabinet somewhere. He like smells it out. He found it and <laughs> tried all day to eat it. And I've been I've been very mean to him about it. <laughs> like, no, you're gonna have it on your boat and you're gonna know I love you. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Oh funny. <laughs> yes, so Stephanie and Marie Booth will be here on um the 14th. And perfect. We'll see you then. Yeah, and we will have the giveaway open for 24 hours if you want to win one of Lori or Carrie's books. I think they both sounded fabulous. Um, I am intrigued by I don't normally go for grisly crime fiction, but you <laughs> definitely got my attention with that. Um, I so yeah. promise you that's probably one of the, the, the most the grisly parts of the book. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm already wanting to figure out what's the story behind that one. So, so thank you both. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Carrie, for spending your evening with us. And well, yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. This was fun. I know it's always nerve wracking when you're going on live with people that you barely know, but um, you handled us well. So we appreciate it. It, it takes a lot to handle us too. We're kind of a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think they can handle it, Don. I yeah, think I they think got we us. Can. Well, we didn't hear if they're helping each other lovingly yet. So. What? <laughs> Insulting each other lovingly. Oh, uh. it's all with love. All with love. Always. I'm, I'm oh, like, love. I'm like, I'm like a sister. I mean, I'm a D. I could be your sister. <laughs> Oh yeah. Maybe we are. Maybe we're long lost sisters. If you're still on mom, Dylan wants to be our sister. Let's, let's Maybe. Go. I mean, I swear I do not look like either one of my siblings. So they're each like a foot taller than me. We're blonde like us. I mean, we're all blonde hair, blue eyes. So you can come on over. Well, I am not a natural blonde and I don't have blue eyes, but <laughs> But I can fake it. I'm faking it well. I fake things really well. So. You do because I thought you were a blonde. See? We'll just end on that note. All right. That's a good idea. All right. Well, everybody, have a good evening. Thanks again for joining us. And we will talk to you soon. All right. Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.